Warwick, I would advise you to make the explanation you were about to give phenomenally good. <laughs> you said get the door. Not good enough, you're fired. With the somewhat disappointing reception to the Blackadder, and more importantly, the huge expense of the first series, the controller of BBC programming, Michael Grade, decided that a lot of changes would be required both in front of and behind the camera before he signed off on a new series of Blackadder, meaning we had to wait three years until 1986 for Blackadder 2, and it was well worth the wait as what we got was, in my opinion, one of the greatest comedies of all time. The first major change was one that happened behind the camera, due to the fact Rowan Atkinson no longer wanted to co-write the show with the returning Richard Curtis, so Ben Elton replaced him as co-writer. Elton, who was a stand-up comedian and writer, is actually credited with choosing the Elizabethan age for series 2 as a setting, as he thought it was a sexy age that the kids can relate to. Now, as someone who went to school primarily in the late 80s and most of the 90s, I can confirm that the Tudor period and the Elizabethan age is definitely one we were taught a lot about at school. Not sure it's uh, entirely relatable or sexy though. Elton was also brought in to hopefully bring the comedy into the situation comedy. With this change made, they now had to reduce costs to please grade. With this in mind, the show was now to be shot at specially created sets at BBC Television Centre, created by Tony Thorpe. The Queen's Throne Room and Blackadder's Living Room were featured throughout, with two more feature sets used per episode, with the sets being deconstructed and reconstructed as required. One location shoot took place before principal photography at Wilton House in Wiltshire. This encompassed one scene for the episode Bells, and the end title sequences. Unlike Series 1, which had a laugh track added in post-production, Series 2 was shot in front of a live audience, and in order to streamline the process of shooting each episode, costume changes were kept to a minimum. Another change from Series 1, where the costumes were often lavish and ever-changing. I bring grave intelligence of your former favourite, Lord Blackadder. Oh, God! It appears... He wishes to marry a girl called Bob. With a change in period and with a cut in costs came changes to the cast, with a reduction in the principal cast and a fixed number of characters appearing in every episode. The three main characters of Blackadder, now Lord rather than Prince Blackadder, Baldrick and Lord Percy Percy all returning, all played by their original actors, with Lord Percy remaining almost exactly the same personality and character wise to his bumbling idiot in series 1. However, both Baldrick and Blackadder had major personality changes. Joining the cast were Stephen Fry as the Lord Chamberlain, Lord Melchit. Fry, who was a well-known comedic actor in the UK due to his comedy double act with Hugh Laurie, and has in fact gone on to become a bit of a national treasure with shows such as QI. Melchit is a somewhat protagonist for Blackadder throughout the series, bringing a pretentious grovelling lackey for the Queen, constantly attempting to one-up and outdo Blackadder for the Queen's affection and attention. Talking of the Queen, she is of course Queen Elizabeth I and she is brilliantly portrayed by Miranda Richardson as a childlike and extremely fecal monarch, with most of the series humour emanating from Blackadder and Melchick competing for her favour. Richardson was early in her career at this point and had only really appeared in one film prior to this playing Ruth Ellis, the last woman hanged in the UK. She's gone on to have a long and distinguished career in both film and television, after, however, the main cast was rounded out by the demented Mad Hatter of a character that is Nursey, the Queen's nanny, again superbly portrayed by Patsy Byrne. An actress who had a long and varied stage, TV and film career stretching all the way back to the 1960s. She would actually go on to work with Tony Robinson in later years in one episode of his children's show Maid Marian and Her Merry Men. Flash my name! Flash by nature! <laughs> Hooray! Hooray! With all those changes explained, we are now ready to tackle the first episode of Series 1, that being Bells, which aired 9th of January 1986 on BBC One at 9.30pm. Although many things changed from Series 1 to 2, something stayed very much the same, with Shakespeare being a major source of inspiration for the plots. 
with Bells essentially being a comedic version of a plot thread from his play Twelfth Night. We open with cameo star Gabrielle Gleister's character Kate talking to her elderly and obviously quite mad father about why he's so sad when he reveals that they are so poor he can't support her anymore and she needs to get a job. A very specific job. The oldest profession even. Father, surely? Yes, Kate. I want you to become a prostitute. Which is a line that gets me every time. It will never not be funny, with this opening scene highlighting the fact that the humour is now going to come far more from straight jokes and situational humour, rather than the prior series' reliance on comedic skits and drama. Kate, disgusted at the thought of becoming a working girl, runs away to seek her fame and fortune in London, which is when we are reintroduced to our main characters. And as an entirely straight, happily married man, all I can say is woof. Because Rowan Atkinson got damn fine between series 1 and 2, with this version of Edmund Blackadder being the great great grandson of the original, being a far more dashing and overall more intelligent and witty character than his great great grandfather ever was. There is, however, a small continuity error created by this reintroductory scene, due to the fact that originally, Head was meant to be the first episode, but was switched with Bells, meaning Lord Percy still has a beard in episode 2, even though he shaves it off here after Blackadder mercilessly teases him about it. With Blackadder being all dashing and handsome, he and Kate now called Bob in his service, having replaced Baldrick, instantly fall in love. With the only scenes in the entire series shot on location being them dating, this montage-like sequence also doubles as a mock advertisement for a tape of medieval themed songs. I don't know if this joke would make any sense to a modern audience, but anyone who was alive in the 80s will instantly recognise what it is poking fun at. This all culminates in this wonderful one-liner from Baldrick. <laughs> don't worry Bob, he used to try and kill me too. Whilst they are about to kiss. Once again, highlighting the humour this season coming far more from the uh, situations the characters find themselves in than individual comedic skits within a drama. We then get a couple more cameos, one from a doctor who holds extremely outdated views on gay people and the wise woman. The wise woman! And two things I must tell ye about the wise woman. She's a woman and she's wise. As Edmund desperately tries to figure out why he's so madly in love with his manservant. In the first series, I feel like these two scenes would have been more drama based and less humorous, but here in series 2 we get great jokes throughout with jokes like this one from Edmund. Here is a purse of monies, which I'm not going to give to you. This line also brings to the fore Edmund's new personality too. He's much more of a sarcastic, laconic asshole than the original ever was. I certainly think the laughs per minute has increased immeasurably as a result. All of this tomfoolery leads to Kate slash Bob revealing to Blackadder that she is in fact a girl and not a boy and then planning to marry. The conclusion to this episode includes the greatest cameo ever in the history of TV in my opinion, that of Rick Mail as Lord Flashhat. He's only on screen a maximum of 5 minutes, probably even less, but he steals the absolute show in a cameo of such memorableness. All I can say is woof. It's been years since I've seen this episode, but as soon as he appeared I find myself instantly cheering when he cheers, woofing when he woofs, and quoting his every line, with this one to nursey being my personal favourite. Am I pleased to see you or did I just put a canoe in my pocket? <laughs> Down. Allegedly, Rick came up with all of his own jokes and even designed his own costume for Flashheart, thus upsetting the writers Elton and Curtis. He kind of upset them too much, however, because Flashheart would reappear in later series. That was another change to series 2 from series 1, with each episode having a notable cameo every episode, with Rick Mail, of course, being the first one. Flashheart steals Bob and leaves Edmund jilted at the altar with the horrendous thought of having to marry the bridesmaid, Baldrick. 
Episode 1 is an absolute laugh a minute of an episode, but I do feel like it doesn't do a great job of introducing the new characters or reintroducing the old ones. Our three main returning characters are reintroduced by a throwaway scene of them shooting arrows at Baldrick as a target. Percy is admittedly given a few big scenes to show just how dumb he is, especially when he mistakes Baldrick in a dress for a beautiful woman. But his character hasn't actually changed much, so we didn't really need much of an introduction anyway. However, Baldrick's new personality isn't ever really front and centre in this episode. In fact, he has very little to do throughout most of it. That goes the same for the three new main characters of Melchit, the Queen and Nursie. They basically get three scenes in the entire episode and none of them really introduces you to the characters. Well, except for the fact Nurse's name is Bernard. And your name is? Baldrick, my lord. But I'll change it to Ploppy if it'll make things easier. <laughs> no, thank you, I can cope with more than one name. The scenes introducing the cast of characters are all in our next episode, Heads, which as I previously said was intended to be episode one. I really wish I knew why they swapped the episode order, but I don't. Now, having rewatched episode 2, which originally aired on 16th of January 1986, I have a theory as to why it was swapped with Bells, but I shall get to that in a moment. Episode 2 is, of course, another religious satire episode satirising the religious persecution of the Reformation and the Tudor monarchs. Predilection for uh, chopping people's heads off at the drop of a hat. We open with probably one of the best known scenes in the whole of Blackadder, with Edmund attempting to teach Baldrick advanced mathematics. So if I add that one to the three, what will I have? Oh, some beans. This is a genuinely funny scene and really does hammer home Baldrick and Blackadder's new personalities. Baldrick is now obviously painfully dumb and Blackadder is as sarcastic as a very, very sarcastic thing, with Percy being vain and just as dumb as ever. The next scene also successfully introduces the new cast and their dynamic, with Melchick reading the Queen a story, showing her childlike tendencies and her insisting elephants are actually orange and Melchick agreeing on pain of death her stubborn cruelty. It also introduces the friendly rivalry that Edmund and Melchi have with this line by Blackadder. Yes, Edmund, Lord Melchi has bad news. <laughs> Lord Melchi is bad news. <laughs> These two scenes are both very funny and effective at reintroducing and introducing the old and new characters, but are sadly about as funny as this episode gets. The storyline sees Blackadder made Minister for Religious Genocide, as he himself says, in charge of executions. Of course, this being Edmund, he tries to cut corners and save time by moving the execution of Lord Farrow to Monday so he can have the middle of a week off work. Lady Farrow petitions the Queen to be able to see Lord Farrow, a man whose description gets ever more ludicrous as time goes on, and that's basically where all the humour for most of this episode comes from. The fact Lord Farrow was a really weird looking guy and Blackadder has to pretend to be him to fool Lady Farrow into thinking he is Lord Farrow. Then in the end, the Queen decides to pardon Farrow, meaning Percy and Blackadder have to come up with a ridiculous plan to save themselves from the chop. Oh, and Baldrick apparently does executions as a hobby. The premise is ridiculous enough to create funny situations, but these fall into the more physical comedy of the first series than the witty dialogue of the first episode and the rest of this series. Added to that, this episode has no big name cameo stars, and Lady Farrow is quite an annoying character. Her voice is like fingernails down a chalkboard for me. So I think with all of those things added up, someone at the BBC took the correct decision to swap episodes 1 and 2 in the running order. Yet yeah, that created a bit of a weird situation where the characters aren't properly introduced and Percy's beard continuity error, but Bells does a far better job of saying, hey look, this series is going in a different direction humour-wise to the first series, whereas Head is far more akin to that first season. That's not to say this episode isn't without its merits. As I've already said, it really does a good job of reintroducing the characters, especially the relationship between Percy and Edmund, which was something that for me never really worked in series 1, whereas here they absolutely nail it, with Percy being desperate to be Blackadder's friend, and Blackadder basically tolerating Percy whilst also mercilessly bullying him at every step. 
you know, like uh, all good healthy male friendships. This dynamic being highlighted by this scene. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. Never ever try to be funny in my presence again, Percy. <laughs> right. One other little oddity about this episode I noticed is that they mention Queen Mary losing her head. No. Ointment. That's what you need when your head's been cut off. <laughs> That's why I gave your sister Mary when they done her. Whereas in reality she died of natural causes. I don't know if this is an oversight or an alternative history storyline liberty. This episode also really lays on the will. They want their love subplot between the Queen and Black Adder, with it being hinted at in episode 1, but really being driven home here. This whole subplot comes to a head with episode 3, Potato. So, you don't know the way to France, I <laughs> No! I must confess that too. Bugger. Which originally aired on the 23rd of January 1986 is a satire of the Age of Discovery and Walter Raleigh, who appears in this episode played by Simon Jones, an actor who is probably most famous for being Arthur Dent in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio series. Raleigh is rather a Wally, and of course Blackadder is entirely nonplussed by this whole exploring thing until the Queen shows sexual interest in Raleigh, and then he suddenly has a cunning plan to sail around the Cape of Good Hope a place no sailor has ever sailed before, and if he does and survives, the Queen agrees that she'd really rather like to marry him. This episode more than the first couple really gives Miranda Richardson time to shine as the Queen. I really enjoy her performance, her version being a cross between a Mean Girls-esque teen and Veruca Salt. Miranda Richardson also almost certainly lends her very distinctive, almost childlike voice to the children singing Sour Puss, Grumpy Face, outside Blackadder's house too. Blackadder is really very laconic and deadpan throughout this series, but never more so than here in this episode, with multiple examples of him just metaphorically killing a person stone dead with a couple of words. You'd never dare. Why, around the Cape, the rain beats down so hard, it makes your head bleed. So some sort of hat is probably in order. Always with hilarious results. But the real show stealer in this episode is Tom Baker in the guest star role as Captain Rum, an actor of course best known throughout the world as the fourth Doctor in the long running BBC series Doctor Who, a role he played for seven series making him the longest running Doctor so far. Now I have always personally loved this performance, but apparently Tom Baker was appalled by it saying, someone should have taken away my equity card, it was terrible and the buggers keep playing it. I can't disagree more, I think it's suitably over the top, a kind of performance that chews every bit of scenery, which is absolutely on point for the captain's supposed mad as a hatter character, hell he's introduced like this. <laughs> Now, if that doesn't just scream comically mad sea captain, I don't know what does. He also has his catchphrase, you have a woman's, insert body part and amusing anecdote as to exactly why that body part is a woman's body part, that he uses on literally everyone, again, delivered in suitably ridiculous and over the top style, which is funny in of itself and then it's repeated endlessly, which makes it even funnier. This being Blackadder, they of course have no plans to actually sail to the Cape of Good Hope. No, they will sail to France, get a suntan and return as heroes. Except uh, Captain Rum doesn't know the way to France, a country you can literally see from England or even have a crew. So they spend the next two years sailing to Australia and back, having to subsist on Baldrick's urine before returning to court, gifting the Queen a funny shaped stick that returns when thrown and Melchie and Sir Walter a bottle of Baldrick's very own fine wine. I've said many times before that humour is entirely subjective, and I find this episode's humour particularly funny, especially when Edmund is being deadpan and the just ridiculous situational humour that crops up throughout. In fact, I think all of the cast have really grown into their roles by this point, especially Tim McKinney as Percy. Whereas in series 1, Percy was a little bit too much like Edmund, 
this series he has a character all of his own. Yes, he's dumber than an empty bag of rocks, but he's also vain and cowardly at times, and a much better foil to bounce jokes off of than he was in series one like these examples. I'm not one of your milksops who's scared out of his mind by the mere sight of water. <laughs> Percy and the new rough. Better. Worse. Uh, fashion today is towards the tiny. Well, in that case, Percy, you have the most fashionable brain in London. <laughs> if I had one complaint so far, it's that we haven't had quite enough Baldrick, or his cunning plans as yet in this series. Will that change in the next episode? That being money. <laughs> You've really worked out your banter, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. This is a different thing. It's spontaneous and it's called wit. Episode 4, which originally aired on 6th of February 1986, is in my opinion an example of when Blackadder is at its best. That being a problem of the week that imperils Edmund, and he and his bumbling chums have to come up with a series of cunning plans to negate it. But the plans fail for various reasons within and without their control, before a deus ex machina essentially returns everything back to normal. This episode, the problem being that Blackadder owes the baby-eating Bishop of Bath and Wells £1,000, and if he doesn't pay up by Evensong, he will be getting a poker up his unmentionables. The Bishop is of course this week's big guest star, that being Ronald Lacey of Indiana Jones fame. More specifically, he's the face-melting Naxi guy from that movie. He gives a great performance as the grotesque bishop here. Of course, a problem needs a cunning plan to solve it, and our three heroes all have their own at hand. Initially, Percy offers his savings he has hidden in a sock behind the kitchen cupboard, but as Blackadder says, You've seen it! Seen it, pinched it, spent it! So instead, Percy tries alchemy and creates stunning green, which is obviously not gold, and it's entirely worthless. So in an outcome that will surprise nobody, Percy fails through sheer stupidity. The Queen also plays a big part in this episode, firstly by calling Edmund to court on pain of death, only to then reveal it was a joke and that she needs Blackadder to pay £85 to Melchie as he won the bet they had, this being the sum total of all of Blackadder's money. Baldrick's cunning plan is that Blackadder pimps himself out down the docks and earns money as a prostitute. With one little change being Baldrick is the hooker, they try this plan and get precisely one customer, who initially wants a peck on the cheek and a story about squirrels, which Blackadder himself has to step in and deliver because Baldrick is too much of an idiot to remember what to say before the John demands a good hard shag which Baldrick provides and nets them a whole sixpence, which is once again taken by the Queen as she pulls yet another hilarious prank on Edmund. Blackadder's initial cunning plan is to sell his house, which he does for £1,100, before yet again the Queen pulls a prank on him and steals even that amount once again, leaving Edmund despondent before he has one final cunning plan. That being to drug the bishop, then paint a picture of him in a sordid and compromising position before blackmailing him with the evidence of his sordidness. A plan so ridiculous, it obviously works like a charm, with Percy dressing up well uh, like this. I described it as a deus ex machina style ending because the entire premise of this working relies on us as an audience and the characters in the story treating a painting like a photograph, which of course it isn't. Either way, it's hilarious. This is a great episode, it has all the main cast playing to their strengths, Percy Baldrick and Edmund's personalities really mesh, giving a lot of opportunity for humour. We also get this quote from Blackadder, which is honestly a maxim for life. The path of my life is strewn with cowpats from the devil's own satanic herd! Also, as I said previously, I just really enjoy this style of episode formula, and talking of things I really enjoy, beer is one of my favourite things, and it just happens to be the next episode's title, and one of the best Blackadder episodes. Oh, Melty, you really are a beginner, you're not even wearing a pair of comedy breasts. Au contraire, Blackadder. <laughs> episode 5 first aired on the 13th of January 1986, and is another episode that revolves around Blackadder getting into a sticky situation, then rather ineptly trying to navigate it. This time his puritanical aunt and uncle are visiting to discuss his inheritance, 
At the very same time, he has agreed to host an absolutely monumental piss-up of a drinking contest with Melchi and 10,000 florins he's riding on it. I'm just going to assume that's a lot of money. To complicate matters even further, the Queen has disguised herself in an attempt to infiltrate the party and find out what happens at these all boy affairs. The actual premise lends itself wonderfully to humour with Blackadder coming up with various means to try and ingratiate himself with his aunt who is the first big name guest star and is someone who appears in probably my favourite episode from series 1. Yes, it's the return of Miriam Margoyle. Initially her husband was meant to be Jim Broadbent to reunite the duo from the first series, this time as Edmund's puritanical relatives. However, Jim was busy and couldn't accept. Never mind though, because Miriam does return and it's even better than the first time round with her portrayal of Lady White Adder. A character who finds literally everything evil, pronouncing Mashed! Yes? Wicked child! <laughs> Mashing is also the work of Beelzebub! For Satan saw God's blessed turnip, and he envied it! And Every time she finds something objectionable, I also love her name for comedy breasts. But what he is trying to tell you is that you appear to be wearing a pair of Devil's Dumplings! <laughs> I actually tried to buy a pair of Devil's Dumplings for this review, but apparently in a country where porn and female sexual aids are both illegal, uh, this is not an easy task. I tried, Chris, but your repeated suggestion of growing a pair of tits to boost this channel's success has fallen at the first hurdle, mate. In complete contrast to this Puritan zeal is the debauched all-boys party attended by Melchie and a couple of other rapscallions, including Stephen Fry's main collaborator in real life, Hugh Laurie. Although this marks Laurie's first ever appearance in Blackadder, he will in fact appear in every episode of Blackadder after this. Laurie plays Simon Partridge, a man who just does this a lot. Stuck in! Wait! Did he get it? <laughs> Well, it sounds a bit rude, doesn't it? Stuck, stuck in! Would have imagined that Hugh Laurie would later go on to star in House and win loads of awards because my first introduction to him was him drunkenly shouting BUM a lot. I should also add that Blackadder can't take his ale so comes up with a cunning plan to get out of drinking any and winning the bet by drinking water. Of course Baldrick botches this and uh, Blackadder ends monumentally drunk with a cardinal's hat on his head and an ostrich feather stuck up his bottom, singing about a little goblin. This infuriates his aunt who storms out not before insulting Percy. Has anyone ever told you you're a giggling imbecile? Oh yes. And cutting Blackadder out of his inheritance. Oh and did I mention that Blackadder had locked the Queen in his cupboard? thinking she was Percy's oft-mentioned but never seen girlfriend Gwendolyn, who on release is then mistaken for a stripper before she gives a comedic version of Elizabeth's famous I may be a woman speech and threatens to have everyone executed in the morning, before another deus ex machina saves them when everyone, including the White Adders, get pissed and forget all about everything, with Miriam Margoyles getting the last laugh with this the very last line. Come on, look! Sounds almost exactly like f I have always enjoyed this episode. The humour works on two main levels. I think mainly as a child because, well, the humour is incredibly juvenile. Really. Involving turnips shaped like thingies and comically sized fake devil's dumplings. Especially Melchit's magnificent pair of golden ones. But as you grow older, you recognise the other side to this is the fact that Blackadder has to deal with on one hand a situation he doesn't really want to be in and on the other people he doesn't want to deal with and as you grow up and you are constantly in those kinds of situations except here it's of course a comedically ridiculous set of situations. I've kind of run out of things to say about this episode and can't think of any convenient segue for the next episode, mainly due to wondering how to scrub comedy fake breasts in both English and Vietnamese from my Google search histories. See what you have done to me, Chris. So we best quickly move on to the final episode of the series, Chains. <laughs> Perhaps they've been kidnapped! Nonsense! As Edmund said, only real idiots get kidnapped. Do they? Oh. Which first 
aired on the 20th of February 1986 and is another absolute classic episode of Blackadder. This week Blackadder and Melchit somehow managed to get themselves kidnapped by Prince Ludwig the Indestructible. Even more hilariously Blackadder describes the very way he gets kidnapped and says only an idiot would fall for it before he is in fact kidnapped exactly like that. Waking up chained to Melchie in a dungeon with only a Spanish jailer for company who insists on torturing Edmund even though there is a little bit of a language barrier with neither speaking each other's languages which leads us to the first big laugh of the episode when the jailer starts playing charades to describe what Blackadder is. Turns out he's the uh, bastard son of a bitch. This escalates the threats of his testuculus being removed and fried over a large fire if he admits to being a lover of Satan. Whilst all this is going on, the B-plot sees Percy become acting Lord Chamberlain and Baldrick become the Queen's pet dog. Baldrick is again criminally underused in this episode, but Tim McKinney gets several chances to show just how much he has perfected his looking comedically gormless. Just as Edmund is about to lose his unmentionables, Prince Ludwig appears played by this week's guest star, actor, and once again, it is Hugh Laurie, who does a great turn in amusing German accents. You know, you talk too much, Black Adam. I think it's a case of Weber diarrhea that you're having. It was funny when Joan Broadbent did it last series, and it's just as funny now when Laurie does it. In fact, this conversation between Edmund and Ludwig is probably one of the funniest sections of the whole series, with Atkinson and Laurie both getting ample opportunities to out-comedy each other, with Edmund just about shading it with his sardonic wit. Ludwig, of course, plans to kill the Queen and take over the realm, a plan that both Melchie and Blackadder agree to help with as long as Ludwig commutes their sentence of death to life imprisonment when the Queen decides to spend a ransom on a party rather than save one of them. They then manage to escape captivity by using the German guard's racial stereotype for ultra efficiency against them, arrive back at court and kill Nursie. Now I haven't discussed Nursie up to this point. And that's because much like Baldrick, she doesn't get a huge amount to do throughout the series. Usually, humorous anecdotes about the Queen's childhood like this one. Well, the first difficult choice you've ever had to make, my little tadpole. No, that's true. Now in the old days, it was all difficult choices. Should you have nursey milk or more cow milk? Or insane tidbits about her own family such as this. Girls are normally called Elizabeth or Mary. And Donald. Mouth is open, nursey should be shut. But it's true, sweet one. I had three sisters and they were called Donald, Eric and Basil. Patsy Byrne, however, does a great job of playing the demented old fool and Nursie's anecdotes are always worth a laugh. It is at this point that Blackadder reveals he didn't kill Nursie. He actually killed Prince Ludwig, who is a master of disguise, as revealed by his oft-repeated catchphrase. You remember when you were in Cornwall at the monastery, there was an old shepherd with whom you used to talk. Good lord, Timkin? Yes! I was one of his sheep! And Nursie is a demented old bag with an udder fetish, and him and Melchie working with Ludwig was all some cunning plan to escape and save the kingdom, with the series ending with Edmund uttering this to the Queen. Madam, life without you was like a broken pencil. <laughs> Explain. Pointless. Except after the credits we get an extra scene where everyone is dead and Ludwig has disguised himself as Queen Elizabeth. Which does beg the question, how does the Blackadder line keep going? Because the original Blackadder died childless as far as I'm aware, unless he had a child with his 8 year old wife. Which doesn't bear thinking about and this Edmund also dies unmarried and childless. So with that shocking revelation we bid goodbye to this second chapter of The Blackadder. But before we do that, I have to talk about my overall thoughts about this series. If you asked me prior to my rewatch, I'd have told you this was my favourite series out of the four. But having watched it for the first time with a critical eye, I have to say it's actually dropped behind my former second favourite, Blackadder Goes Forth. Don't get me wrong, I still love this series. I think the laughs per minute has increased tenfold from series one, and most of that humour comes from situational comedy rather than sketches within a historical drama, but being critical, it does fail in the following areas. Number one, that second episode isn't that funny, 
and it isn't up to the same quality as the rest of the series in my opinion, it falls far more into the first series category, it's not bad but it isn't that funny an episode. Secondly, the cast is way too big, so a lot of the main cast who appear every episode sometimes maybe get one or two lines. This means Baldrick spends a lot of time being essentially a background character, which is just a total waste. Nursie has almost nothing to do throughout and by two episodes neither does Melchi, which is possibly why for series 3 the cast will once again cut down, but that's a matter for another video, which hopefully will be out in one month's time. So if you want to watch that, consider subscribing, like this video if you want, and comment if you have anything to say.